Hey friends, welcome back to the channel. So recently there seems to be a bit of an epidemic of YouTubers who seem to be quitting. It's not clickbait. But I just, if I'm honest with you guys, don't want to do this anymore. I'm no longer going to be making these videos. For the first time in nearly five years, I am bringing them to an end. Now it's time to take a breather. I can't keep this up. On March 9th, I will be hosting my last theory episode. And I think this is a very interesting phenomenon to study. It's interesting because on the surface, YouTube seems to be a dream job. There's a lot of people who aspire to be YouTubers, who aspire to rich, riches and fame and flexibility, and you can work from wherever you want. But the people who are there, a lot of them seem to be quitting for various reasons, burnout and tiredness and stress and all the stuff that we're gonna go into. In this video, I kinda wanna talk through why people seem to be quitting. And secondly, what we can learn from their experience. And by we, I kind of mean me. I, I'm, I'm sort of treating this video as a bit of like notes to myself because I'm a YouTuber in case you didn't know. And I don't want to go the same way that a lot of these other YouTubers are going with the various reasons they're quitting the platform. Because for me, it is a dream job. But I also think the phenomenon is interesting to study in the same way that when someone really rich tells us that, oh, actually money doesn't buy happiness. It's worth taking those things seriously as well because whether, we, whether we're conscious of it or not, a lot of our behavior is driven by aspiration towards status, fame, money, success. And if the people who have gotten the thing that we think we want are telling us, mm, maybe I would, <laughs> you know, maybe I would do differently or maybe it's not all it's cracked up to be, it's worth taking that seriously and figuring out, okay, cool, what can I change about how I'm approaching my life now, learning from the wisdom of these people who are already at this place where I aspire to be. Now, a big reason that a lot of YouTubers seem to be citing for quitting is burnout to some degree or another. Like whether they're just really tired of all of this, they've been doing it for seven plus years and they're just like, they can't be bothered to do it anymore. I'm so tired. There's nothing in my life right now except work. Or they feel super stressed about, stressed about it or they feel super depressed about it. I don't get any satisfaction from the type of work that I do here anymore. And there seem to be a few different reasons that YouTubers are citing for why they feel like they're experiencing this burnout. The first one is you sort of trade a nine to five job for a 24 seven job. And these days, entrepreneurship and doing your own thing and having your own hustle and stuff is very, very, very glorified. It was kind of weird to be an entrepreneur maybe like 15 years ago, where you know, you'd be looked at weird if you had your own business. But now, people seem to look at you weird if you don't have your own business, especially if you, you, know, if you follow the, trend, uh, the, the various trends on social media. So it seems like you really trade a nine to five for a 24 seven. Um, I've definitely experienced this where back when I had a real job, I would go home from work and unless I was really worried about like making a mistake that might kill someone, uh, which happened thankfully very few times, <laughs> uh, me worrying about that, that is, I was able to get home from work and I was able to switch off. I was able to relax. I was able to do other things without work being always on my mind. But when I started my business, back when I was like 19, from then on, every waking hour has basically been spent thinking and strategizing and like working on in some way the business. When I'm in the shower, I'm thinking about my YouTube channel and I'm thinking about my business. When I'm at the gym, I'm thinking about the YouTube channel and business. Even when I'm in conversations with friends at a restaurant or a board games night, part of my brain is thinking about like content ideas. And it's something that really doesn't switch off. So this seems to be a big part of why people are quitting because they've traded the nine to five for 24 seven and they're just tired of spending their entire like physiology and psychology thinking about this thing. A second big reason why people seem to be quitting is this feeling of being on a never ending content hamster wheel. The algorithms are changing all the time. Audience preferences are changing all the time. Every single month, each of these different social media platforms are becoming more and more saturated, which means they're becoming more and more competitive. And so if you've built a career on this, you sort of feel like, well, I can't stop now. I have to just keep going. I have to make the next video and the next video and the next video. You make a video, you release a TikTok, whatever, you know, whatever the thing might be, and it's just onto the next one and the next and the next. And we sort of feel the sense of, um, you know, I can't afford to take a break. Because if I take a break, well, you know, technically YouTube says that taking a break is fine for your channel, but I know that, you know, if, 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 if I didn't upload for a month, then maybe my audience would forget me because there's all this other content. And then maybe when my video comes out, I don't know, the algorithm might not notify the right people. And there's this whole thing that makes it feel you have to keep coming up with new stuff and you're never allowed to take a break. And it's coming up with new stuff that can also be really taxing, really mentally taxing for people. Uh, for example, let's say you're like me and you're making videos about personal development and productivity. And if my channel were purely productivity, if the only videos I, I thought I was allowed to make was videos about productivity, I would start to feel very burned out very quickly because I'd run out of content ideas and I would feel like I'm repeating the same stuff over and over again. And people in the comments would start to be like, bro, this is getting a bit repetitive. 
And I would think, oh, but like, but you don't get it. Like, I need to be consistent. I need to upload for the algorithm. I need to upload for the audience. Like, without the audience, without the, without the growth, if you're not growing, you're declining. And I guess I have to repeat the content. And like, most people don't watch most of the videos, so repeating the content is totally fine. And you get into this sort of never-ending hamster wheel of content creation for the sake of consistency, for the sake of audience, and for the sake of the algorithm. Added to that, you also have the feeling when you, if you are lucky enough to make a living doing this sort of thing, talking to a camera in your bedroom, you think, damn, I've got it really good. You know, I don't want to go back to my day job. I've got freedom, fun, flexibility. I can do what I want. Uh, I've got it so good, I don't want to let it go. And this feeling of if I don't stop working, it might all go away is a really terrifying feeling that keeps up so many YouTubers at night, including me. By the way, if you're wondering about the absolutely sick background music that you've been hearing throughout this video, then that is very kindly brought to you by Epidemic Sound, who are in fact sponsoring this video. Now, Epidemic Sound is amazing. I've been using Epidemic Sound since 2017, since I first started my YouTube channel, on the recommendation actually of Peter McKinnon when I was watching his stuff. And Epidemic Sound are just the best source for background music. They've got an absolutely enormous library. It's got over 40,000 songs and 90,000 sound effects. And all of these are restriction free. So you can use them pretty much in whatever way you want in your videos. All of the music is professionally produced and it's all original. That is 100% owned by Epidemic. So there's never a chance that your videos are gonna get a claim or a takedown in the future. And they've got music for basically every mood. You can have like soaring and inspiring, like instrumental and music with lyrics. Back when I was doing actual vlogs, I was like really, really going for like instrumental while I was talking and then like lyrics when I was doing B-roll. These days it's mostly instrumental music because most of our videos are me just talking throughout the whole thing. And so within their absolutely huge library, there is basically something for every kind of mood you could possibly imagine for your videos. And any music that you do use in your videos remains licensed even after you've ended your subscription. So if you wanna try out Epidemic Sound, then do check out the link in the video description and that will give you a completely free seven day trial and you can browse the library to your heart's content. So thank you so much Epidemic Sound for sponsoring this video and let's get back to it. Another thing that some YouTubers have cited is because when you become successful on a platform, uh, you then start to treat it more like a business. And as you treat it more like a business, you realize that delegation is a thing that you can do. You can maybe delegate your video editing. You can maybe delegate like coming up with video ideas. You can maybe hire a thumbnail designer to do the thumbnails because thumbnails are really important. And maybe while you're there, you can also delegate the writing of the videos because you know you don't need to be the one writing the videos. And before you know it, you have outsourced <laughs> and optimized the fun out of the job that you have. You have turned it from a thing that you were once using to express your creativity and where you were overjoyed about the fact that you could provide value to an audience and you've turned it into a job where you've gone from a creator to a manager. And most creators do not enjoy being managers. Most creators are not very good at being managers. I'm not very good at being a manager. <laughs> and so when I had to manage people, I started to think, oh my God, like, have I, I've, I've created this prison for myself where I feel like I'm on a constant kind of content hamster wheel. I have to keep on churning out the videos. I've hired people to take aspects of the job away from me so that I can make more videos. But now I need to make more videos to keep up the salaries of those people who I've hired. And also now I need to manage those people I've hired and there are people and people have like their own issues where I now need to worry about their personal development, their professional development. I need to make sure they're happy. I need to make sure I'm giving them enough work. And if I want to take a break, well, I'm the one filming the videos. And so the editor won't have anything to edit, but I'm still paying the editor. And so like, I really shouldn't take a break. And this whole thing just, it's like the, the, the treadmill just keeps on continuing just at a, at, a, at a higher and higher pace. So you feel like you're having to run to just keep up with the fact that you now have a team to support. You have people's livelihoods that are at stake. You might have people who have quit their jobs and who have mortgages that are based on the salary that you're paying them. So you even more feel like, oh, I can't take a break. I better not screw this up, which ties into the whole constant hamster wheel. And yeah, most creators do not enjoy being managers. And another big thing that seems to happen um, is when you have been doing YouTube for long enough, you have periods of boom and you have periods of bust. There are times when the channel is going really well and the business is flourishing. And then there are the times where it's not. And in those times where it's not, you start to feel depressed. You start to feel like, oh my God, are my videos any, even valuable anymore? Like no one's watching my stuff. Oh God, like the channel is dying because the signals you get from YouTube analytics is that your channel is literally dying because the numbers are gray and the arrows are down. And that feeling when something was growing and is now declining is a really, really, really hard feeling to uh, come to terms with in any area of, in a, any area of your life. In Will Smith's autobiography, biography, um, Will. Uh, he talked about how losing money is bad, but losing fame is even worse. There is a certain pain that celebrities get when they start to feel irrelevant, when they start to feel like they have lost the fame that they once had. That really cuts at like the core of the human psyche, where we have this intrinsic need for social status and for the approval of others because we're human and it's how humans have evolved. Like even in a, in a small group, if for example, you have a group of eight friends and maybe like seven of those friends got into like a really good university and then you got into like a less good university and you feel like your, your social status has been like reduced in the, in the group. 
it sounds trivial, but it's a really painful experience. I had this experience in 2016. Uh, three years into running my first business, SixMed. It was a business where I was helping people get into med school. And for the first three years, we were growing and growing and growing. And then in year four, the revenue declined by a little bit. I think we did 150K revenue the year before and 140K uh, the year after. And that was like, bloody hell. I, I mean, and it sounds weird. Like, you know, a business while I was in medical school doing 140K, 150K, like what difference does it really make? But the reduction, the fall, the decline in the thing caused me to have this whole spiral of negativity and this whole spiral of like, oh, what am I doing with my life? And eventually I read a couple of books about it and I wrote a blog post. This was the very first blog post that I ever put online on my website, uh, Time Versus Money. And I came to a few realizations, but it took me like months of journaling about this and thinking about it and talking to people about it, reading books about it, to come to terms with what on the surface was only a 10K drop in revenue. And so these are a bunch of reasons why people seem to be quitting the platform. And so the real question is, what can we learn from this? What can we learn? I think a lot of this comes down to the analogy of the goose and the golden eggs. There is a story of a farmer who has a goose and he realizes, oh my goodness, the golden goose lays these golden eggs. Wow. And then he takes the eggs to market and they make lots of money. And then the next day, the goose lays some more eggs and he takes the egg to market and it makes loads of money. And then the farmer gets rich and he buys a fancy house and everything. And all the time, the goose just continues to lay these golden eggs. And then one day the farmer decides, you know what? This goose has got a lot of golden eggs inside it. So why don't I just kill the goose and then I'll open up the goose and I'll take up and, and I'll take all these golden eggs and then I'll be super rich. And I'll be able to quit my job or you know, whatever the thing might be. And so he kills the goose, he opens it up and lo and behold, he finds no golden eggs. And now the goose is dead and now there are no more golden eggs. This is something that Stephen Covey uses as an example in his amazing book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And he calls it the difference between production and production capacity. The goose is the production capacity. It is the asset that creates the production, the golden eggs. All of life and work and business and everything is a balancing act between the golden eggs and the goose, between the production and the production capacity. And now when it comes to YouTube videos or a business or a social media empire or anything, the videos that you produce each day or each week or each month are the golden eggs and the asset that produces the videos, i.e. the creator themselves and their team is the goose. And the thing that all these social media platforms encourage in a subconscious and very conscious way as well, is a focus on the golden eggs and not thinking about the health of the goose. It's a focus on what's that next video? How does that next video perform to the other videos that you've, that you've released? What's the retention stats on that video? Oh, you know, there's sponsors on that video. Okay, cool. So the sponsors are looking at the last 10 golden eggs, the last 10 videos to see how much did those golden eggs weigh? And if you got more views on those videos, you're more likely to get sponsorships. And they're like, okay, cool. And the next one, the next one, the next one. And there is no analytic that is around like the health of the channel overall or the health and mental health and stability and sustainability of the creator who's doing the work or of the team that's behind the work. And so a lot of the lessons that I'm personally taking away from this phenomenon of YouTuber burnout and YouTubers quitting the platform is really centering back to this idea of, sure, creating the golden eggs of YouTube videos is a pretty freaking sick job. It's a dream job in many ways but how do I make sure I'm not neglecting the goose itself? I eat my own physical health, my own mental health, my own enjoyment of the process, like the whole thing feeling enjoyable and sustainable for me. And also the whole thing feeling enjoyable and sustainable and low stress for my team, because that's the goose and the videos of the golden eggs. Okay, so practical strategies for doing so. The first one is a quote that I came across recently from a video game developer who said that, left unchecked, gamers will optimize the fun out of the game they're playing. Left unchecked, gamers will optimize the fun out of the game that they're playing. And left unchecked, YouTubers will optimize the fun out of it. When we're focusing on growth and optimization, we stop focusing on having fun. <laughs> we stop focusing on feeling good about the videos. We think, okay, the next video I make needs to go viral. And so how do I make the most viral video? How do I make the clickbaitiest title and the clickbaitiest thumbnail? And how do I make sure like, I'm not saying too much stuff and I'm not saying the stuff I wanna say, I'm saying the stuff the audience wants to hear. And how do I make sure I can reply to all the, all of this sort of stuff is optimizing, is at risk of optimizing the fun out of the game. And one way to keep the goose alive while it's creating golden eggs is to make the process enjoyable and keep it fun. A question me and my team always think about is how do we help Ali have more fun filming these videos? Tintin, my YouTube producer, it's like front of, front of mind for him. It's like, yeah, sure, you know, my KPI is to grow the YouTube channel and all that crap. But also, how do I make sure Ali's enjoying the process? Because if Ali stops enjoying the process, then the whole business will die because me enjoying the process of making videos is one of the things that keeps the goose alive. And so the note that I'm giving to myself is, with anything I'm doing, how do I make sure I'm not optimizing the fun out of it? How do I make sure to keep the process 
enjoyable, energizing, and sustainable so that I can continue playing this game. Now, on that note, there is um, a book called Finite and Infinite Games. Um, I haven't read the book, but I've read like the first page, which lays out the thesis of it, which is basically in life, there are two types of games. There are finite games and then there are infinite games. A finite game is played with the intention of winning the game. A game of football, for example, it comes to a close, there is a scoreboard and the goal is to win. But then you have infinite games where the goal is not to win the game. The goal is to keep on playing the game. Your relationship with your spouse is an infinite game. Your relationship with your family is an infinite game. The goal is not to win or to get something out of it. The goal is to just simply continue being able to play the game. For me, what I've realized is that YouTube is now an infinite game. YouTube started off as a finite game for me where I was like, oh, you know, I just want to do this channel for like two years and then I'll see what happens. And then maybe one day, one day it'll make money. And now I'm at a point where I could turn YouTube into a finite game where I'm thinking about a scoreboard and thinking about getting to the next subscriber milestone and be like, oh, we're at 5 million, let's go for 10 million and all that kind of stuff. And treating it as a finite game that has a scoreboard. Or I could approach it like an infinite game. And this is how I'm trying to approach YouTube. I don't really have a goal other than to be able to continue doing this thing. I already have a dream job. The only thing that makes sense is to continue to make it sustainable. How do I ensure that I continue to have a dream job for the long term? That means being okay with under-optimizing for growth. That means being okay with making a long ass video with like not a very clickbaity title and thumbnail that doesn't really fit into the category of productivity like this video, just because I feel like it. And I think there's something interesting to share here and I wanna take away lessons from it for myself. And I know that maybe one or two people in the audience might take away some lessons from it as well. But I know it's a video that's not gonna go viral. It's a video that might, might not do too well in the algorithm, but I'm doing it anyway, because part of the whole thing is that part of the goal is to be able to continue doing this thing. Now, given that for me and for a lot of people I know, YouTube is an infinite game, it's worth really connecting with why. Why are we playing this game at all? Why bother continuing to make YouTube videos? And basically every big YouTuber I know, actually every small YouTuber as well, basically every YouTuber I know has an existential crisis about their YouTube channel and their business about every three months where they question, hmm, why, why am I doing this again? And I think those moments of questioning are really important because it's, it, it is very useful <laughs> to regularly question our motives and the reason why we're doing stuff. But when I find myself questioning why I'm doing YouTube, um, every three months or so, it always comes back to a few different prompts. One of those prompts is that if I won the lottery, if I had 100 million in the bank, would I still continue doing YouTube? And the answer is yes, I would still continue making videos. And then I ask myself, okay, what form would that look like? What does the YouTube channel where I've got 100 million and I don't need to make money anymore, what does that look like? What it looks like is I get to make videos whenever I want. I make videos about the topics that I feel like doing. I don't think too hard about titles and thumbnails. Maybe I can let my team think about that. And, you know, I'd be totally okay with making a video like this one where maybe it's not going to go viral, but that's okay because I still want to make the video anyway. If I read a book that I think is interesting, like, I don't know, this one, I read this the other day. I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to make a video about it. It's a cool book. I've decided to make a video about it. If there's like a series I want to make because I feel like there's a problem that people are struggling with and I have something to share. You know what? Let's turn it into a video. Let's turn it into a series. Maybe I'll do vlogs every now and then. And I do vlogs on my second channel, which you can check out link down below if you want. That's what I would do even if I won the lottery. I would still make YouTube videos. And so a question I often think about is how can I act as if I've already won the lottery? How can I build the YouTube channel that I, I would have even if I wasn't being paid for it and just lean, lean as much into that as possible? Obviously, there are market demands and it is a business at the end of the day. So I may, I may not be able to lean 100% into that, but knowing that that is my North Star, the dream YouTube channel that I would do even if I won the lottery, means that it sort of keep, it, it gives me a, a destination to sort of aim towards. And if I go too far off that destination, because if the, the titles and thumbnails start to become a bit too clickbaity or we've got too many sponsors or any, all, all of this sort of stuff, it allows me to see the North Star of the destination and to be able to revert back to be like, okay, no, let's take things back a little bit. And it's never gonna be perfect. It's always gonna be a bit of a windy path to stay on track with a destination. But knowing that that destination is there, the YouTube channel I would have even if I won the lottery, that to me gives me a lot of clarity. Now, the problem is, one problem that I, that, that I do sometimes see is where I have lots of friends who do YouTube, but they would not do YouTube if they won the lottery. They are doing YouTube primarily for money because it is a thing that makes revenue and makes profit and gives them fun, freedom, and flexibility. But if they had, if they didn't care about making money, they would honestly not do YouTube. This is a harder place to be because now the reason you're doing it is for the money and it has now become a job. It is very hard for something to feel like play or to feel like fun if the primary reason for doing it is for the money. There are still plenty of ways to do so. You can read my book. There's a whole like three chapters about how to make everything you're doing a little bit more fun. But if the primary reason, and especially if the only reason you're doing a YouTube channel is to make money, uh oh, that's gonna run into all these problems with the burnout stuff. 
So whether you're in that position or not, whether you're like me and you would do YouTube anyway, or whether you're like some of my friends and you're, you're kind of primarily doing it for the money, either way, the place we want to get to is a place of service. And Daniel Pink has a great book called Drive, which is all about intrinsic motivation. Intrinsic motivation is the motivation that we, where we do something for the sake of the thing itself, whereas extrinsic motivation is when we're doing something for the, ex for the sake of the external reward associated with it. I am doing YouTube for the money is extrinsic motivation. I'm doing YouTube because it's fun and because I can help people is intrinsic motivation. We connect to intrinsic motivation when we feel like there is a purpose behind the thing that we're trying to do. The three things that Dan Ping talks about are from self-determination theory in psychology, and they're autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Autonomy, we have freedom and flexibility to do what we want. You kind of get that in YouTube to an extent if you don't worry too much about the algorithm and you don't worry too much about what the audience wants. Mastery, the feeling that you are getting better at the thing. That is profoundly addictive. That profoundly leads to intrinsic motivation. You can get that through YouTube by trying to make your videos a little bit better over time. And purpose. The feeling that the thing that we are doing has a purpose beyond just ourself. It has a way of helping other people. And so the point of this video is not for me to make money, even though I might make money from it. The point of this video is not for me to grow my following, even though it might happen. The point of this video is service, is to help the person who is watching the video on the other end. How do we connect into that? How do we tap into that spirit of service? I have a bunch of different methods for doing this because I've realized over the years that this is ridiculously important. I have a whole like five step thing that I read whenever I read to myself whenever I do a video. This is what that thing says. I don't care about the performance of this video. My only goal in making it is to share a message that I think is worth sharing for whoever wants to hear it. Point number two, I intend to integrate my mind, heart and soul to share this message in a way that feels authentic and natural. Point number three, I'm not trying to force anything here. I am merely speaking from the heart, with the mind to inform structure and content, and the soul to remain connected to the purpose behind the video. Point number four, I'm going to enjoy myself and treat this process with lightness and ease. When I'm on my deathbed, I would give anything to be back here, in the present moment, doing what I love, sharing myself and my learnings with the world in a way that's enjoyable and energizing. I'm going to keep that in mind and not treat this process with too much seriousness, heaviness, or importance. And point number five, I am speaking to an individual who really cares what I have to say and who really wants to learn from me to level up their own life. I am in service to that person, not to my own ego, not to the retention stats, not to the algorithm. I'm purely in service to the person who has clicked on this video and whose life can genuinely be changed by what I'm about to say. That is a five step kind of mantra, affirmation, whatever you want to call it, that I read before I do videos as a way of connecting to the spirit of service behind the video. The other thing I find super helpful personally for connecting with the spirit of service is, this may sound a bit grandiose, but bear with me. Basically, what I imagine when I'm planning a video is I imagine that I am a university lecturer <laughs> and I've got tenure and I do a weekly lecture series titled, How to Build a Life You Love. And every week I show up and I deliver a lecture. And when I'm giving this lecture, you know, it might be 20 minutes long, it might be 30, 40, 50 minutes long, whatever. Maybe there's some Q and A at the end, but I'm delivering it to a lecture hall with a hundred people and they all really want to be there. The reason they're there, they don't have to be, it's not compulsory. They're not taking, they're not getting any extra credits by doing so, but they're there because they really want to be. And they're hanging on to my every word because they look up to me and they think that I have something to offer that could help them build a life they love. And when I connect to that, when I really visualize that, that thing of, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just the lecturer. I'm just speaking about this thing. Now, every video I make is with that in mind. When I'm making a video about a book that teaches you how to make a million dollars in a weekend, it's, it's a bit of a clickbaity title. Million Dollar is a really good book by my friend uh, Noah Kagan. It, it's good, would recommend reading it. But when I'm making the video, when I'm planning the video, what I'm thinking is, okay, this next lecture is about what we can learn from the book Million Dollar Weekend and how we can apply it to help build a life that we love. So how do I connect to that? Rather than how do I connect to, ooh, the revenue per meal for this video is gonna be high because it's a book about finance and ooh, this video might get views because it's about how to start a business and everyone start a business. And I'm like, when I start thinking in those ways, I start to get into this extrinsically motivated reason for doing the video. But when I think, hey, I'm just a lecturer here. I'm here to share stuff. Then I think, okay, cool. What can I share from the heart that would genuinely help people based on my reading of the book and based on my own experience with entrepreneurship that can help people build a life they love. I keep on having to come back to this because again, the default, if we don't think about this stuff actively, is to fixate on the numbers and the metrics that, that show up on YouTube stats and like the social media. Whereas when we can find a way to connect to the spirit of service, which is partly why I love doing talks in person because people will come up to me and be like, oh my God, that was amazing. It's like, that really helps me connect to the spirit of service. Connect to the spirit of service in anything that you're doing and it will become more enjoyable, energizing and intrinsically motivating. Now, final thing to mention, 
um, is something that I took away from a Zoom call that I had with James Clear. So when I was in the process of uh, figuring out like the promotion strategy for my book, uh, James Clear, the author of Atomic Habits, very kindly offered to hop on a Zoom call with me. And we talked about like, I don't know, marketing strategies and, th and this sort of stuff. And one of the main reasons I actually wanted, <laughs> I wanted to speak to him wasn't because he could help me with marketing, even though he could do that, but it was because I wanted to ask what his life is like. So James Clear has sold a stupidly large number of copies of his book, Atomic Habits. He's made loads and loads of money. But he doesn't seem to be striving for more and more. He has not created an online course called the Atomic Habits Academy. He has not tried to launch a high ticket offer. He's not tried to grow his team particularly. I think he has like one team member. He does like two talks a month or something like that. He's got a wife and kids. He takes the kids to school and picks them up every single day and doesn't seem to be working too hard. He doesn't seem to be going for growth at all costs. I gathered all this just from kind of observing him from like the background. And so I, I asked him, hey man, like, you know, you're pretty successful. Like, <laughs> How do, you, how do you think about spending your time and growth and business and stuff? And why don't you make an Atomic Habits Academy course? And what he said was really interesting. He was like, you know, what I've realized is the thing that works for me is to draw a box around what I want my day and my life to look like. And within the context of that box, I have a block for work. And within that work box, I will then optimize for money. And so he said for him, you know, his box is like, he, he knows he wants to be there as a present dad. He knows, he knows he wants to take his kids to school and pick them up. And so he knows that he only wants to work between like 10 a.m. and like 3 p.m. or something like that. This is the box that he's created around what he wants. He has defined constraints for himself. If he were to work harder to make an online course, it would probably go outside of those constraints. He would need a bigger team. He would need to become a manager. He's, he's decided, screw that. I actually don't want that. I love that way of thinking because so often we think about the goal. We think about what's the thing that I want. And we don't think about what are the constraints that I would like to operate under? Because if you just define a goal as, you know, I want to make two videos a week or I want to get to a million subscribers or whatever the thing might be, without defining the limits of the box, then you start to stretch into burnout territory. You start to think, well, I've only published one video this week and I needed to do two. And so like consistency is important and algorithm and audience. So you know what, just this once I'm going to skip a workout or just this once I'm going to cancel on my friends. But if you define the box as, and you know, this is what the most, the, the happiest entrepreneurs I know do, if you define the box as, I'm only allowed to work between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. and I'm never gonna work beyond that. And I never work to deadlines. And if I'm ill, I take the time off and I give myself a month off every quarter or something like that. Like, you can define whatever constraints you want and within those constraints, you can find a way to get to the goal. Now, within those constraints, the goal might be unrealistic, in which case, great, let's change the goal. But it's, it's like starting with lifestyle first. What is the life that you want? and then thinking about your business or your YouTube channel or your work. Second, instead of going like, I want a YouTube channel to hit 10 million subscribers and then thinking like, what life do I want? I think more of a recipe for like a happy, fulfilled, balanced life is what is the life I want? And what is the YouTube channel or the business or the job that helps facilitate that without taking away from the actual lifestyle? Because this is the real problem with entrepreneurship. Yes, it's freaking amazing to be able to have autonomy and mastery and purpose and to do your own thing and to be able to work from anywhere and to make stupid, stupidly large amounts of money while doing the thing in a way that you correlate from your time and to make money while you sleep and passive income. All of that stuff is freaking incredible. But we have to recognize that all of that stuff is a means to an end. It is not the end in itself. And the end that we're going for is a healthy, happy, balanced, fulfilled and meaningful life. And so if we're sacrificing our health and our relationships for the sake of making more money, even though we don't need that money, that's like, why are we doing the thing? And so recently, you know, you, might, you guys might've seen the life update video I did. I said, hey, I've decided I'm not gonna have any deadlines on the videos. I'm decided, I've decided I'm gonna film whatever videos I want rather than the videos I think the audience wants. Although there's obviously a little bit of, a little bit of both there. I've decided I'm not gonna be overly focused on like trying to optimize for retention and stuff. These are the constraints that I've added to my life and to my business, which may well hinder growth, but they're constraints that help me live the life that I want and the business then supports the life rather than the other way around. And I was at a good um, a retreat that was run by my, my, my friend Tiago Forte, where I, I met a bunch of other online course creator, author type people. And one of the questions that one of the people asked was, you know, just like a, a question to think about, do you work for your business or does your business work for you? And at the time, this was about a year ago, I definitely felt like I worked for my business. I felt like I was an employee of this business that I'd created and I had all these things I had to do and I didn't have too much autonomy. And over time, I've tried to get more to the point where I feel like my business works for me. I start with the life I want and the business helps facilitate that rather than the other way around. Now, one of the ways to do this is to, you know, ideally try and build a business that doesn't rely on the views. 
because you know a lot of YouTubers I know who rely on AdSense and brand deals to get their money and to support their business and the team and stuff, that is a recipe for burnout because now you're chasing views constantly. But whereas what I'm trying to get to with our business and what a lot of other YouTubers I know are trying to do as well, is how do we get to a point where the videos, where, where we're not so reliant on the view count on videos. And this involves actually just building a business and like trying to build products that add value to people outside of kind of the value that the creator themselves adds to the process. It involves building systems for sales and marketing and operations and finance and like legal and HR and like all of the stuff around building a business. One way in which me and my team are trying to build this business that isn't reliant on view counts is we have a program called the Part-Time YouTuber Accelerator, which is like a 12 month program where if you join, you have to apply to join. Uh, you basically get help from me and my team in growing your YouTube channel or your business. And you can get like office hours with my team every single week and like loads of support from our team of customer success people. We get like amazing results for our students. Like our students absolutely love it. And you know, if you're new to YouTube, like it sort of gives you a bit of a sort of emotional support in getting, getting the channel off the ground. And if you're a pro already, then you kind of shortcut a lot of the learning process and you learn from the systems that we've already created. But the nice thing is that a lot of this stuff is decorrelated from me as an individual. Our students are coming to my team with support requests and the team can, can make that happen rather than coming to me specifically to be like, hey, Ali, I need your help with thing X. But it's like things like that, that we're trying to think about a lot more where it's like figuring out like, what is this, what is the subset of our audience that has a specific problem? And then how can we as a business solve that problem in a way where me as an individual, I don't need to be massively involved. But the final thing I really wanted to say in this video is, you know, there's this quote from Buddhism or wherever, which is, the only constant is change. You know, I've made this video essentially as notes to myself, things that I would like to keep in mind for myself to continue playing the infinite game of YouTube because I've been doing it for seven years now. It still is a dream job, provided I keep in mind the goose and the golden egg stuff and provided I keep in mind the things I've said in this video. But at some point, I may also quit YouTube. And as and when I do, that will also be okay. Everything will work out okay in the end. There's never any reason to worry, all that stuff. But I, I would like the decision to, to do that to not be a decision born out of pain, but a decision that's born out of a desire for something different. Um, I don't want it to feel like, oh, doing, I'd love to continue doing YouTube, but it's just getting so painful that I'm just so tired of it. Instead, I'd love to feel like, you know what? It's actually been a great ride. And I'm even more excited about doing something else. Um, that's where I'd like to be with this YouTube type stuff. And so as long as the journey continues, if you've watched to the end of this ridiculously long video, uh, I hope that you might choose to follow along and watch some of the videos and maybe sign up to my newsletter, alindal.com slash Sunday. I send an email every week. But if not, then that's also okay. One of the big realizations I think that a lot of YouTubers come to is that the audience is also impermanent. The people who followed my channel three years ago are broadly not the same as the people who are watching my channel right now. And that's also totally okay. Um, just being okay with the fact that like, you put videos out there and they might not get as many views as the ones that we put out two years ago, three years ago, four years ago, five years ago. It's also okay. As long as we just sort of keep in mind the fact that it's in the spirit of service, the goal is not to grow the audience. The goal is to help people. The goal is to connect to that spirit of service. The goal is to provide as much value as possible. And if the audience grows as a side effect, then that's amazing. And ideally it generates leads for a business to help make the business be a vehicle that doesn't rely on me. And that's also amazing. I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, if you did, and you've not yet seen my really long life update video, you probably have an appetite for really long videos. You might like to check that out over there. I'd also love to hear in the comments, what is one thing that you've personally taken away from this video, if you've, if you've gotten to the end, uh, that you can help apply to your own life, whether you're a YouTuber or not. I'd love to hear that down in the comments. Uh, I read all of them, even if I can't reply to all of them. But yeah, check out this video if you wanna see another really long one about like my thoughts about YouTube and like what it's like to be a YouTuber and stuff like that. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. Have a lovely day and I'll see you next time.